first speaker today, um, Dr. Lexi Bronich, who actually comes to us from UCLA. Um, because we have other proud UCLA graduates. And who is um, involved in the really interesting creation of a new residential community on this campus at Bowles Hall, the beautiful castle-like building that you all may have seen. Uh, but he's here today to talk to us about his research on um, the archaeology of Cusco, and also, I understand, to show some of the um, new kinds of techniques or uh, new uh, material that he's working with. So, if you'll join me in welcoming Dr. Ramich. Thank you very much. So it's, it's nice to be standing on this side giving a little lecture. A lot of folks here that I recognize. Uh, so I have a, a, lot of, a lot of good feelings for this place. Um, I also thank you for allowing me to present at, at this time. I'm, I'm off for the Northeast Andean Conference, so it's always nice to be able to present in front of a home audience uh, to see if uh, all the slides work, the graphics are in, uh, in proper resolution, the jokes are funny, and so on. So you guys will be my test as we go through it. Before I get to Cusco, I just wanted to briefly go through uh, another part of my work that I started here at UCLA and have continued at, uh, here at, at UC Berkeley, uh, specifically in the Jacobs lab, uh, the 3D printing lab. And I mention that mostly to see who else is interested in using this in their own work. I went there with Nico, we checked it out uh, to see how this technology can be used. I'll just give you an example of the way that I'm using it, and then if you want to talk to about this, absolutely, please. And this is the work I have been doing in Tiwanaku, uh, and my work there ended, uh, field work ended in 2006. And since then, it's been extremely difficult to go back to work itself at Tiwanaku. Uh, and um, so I've been in the process of writing things up and publishing and so on. I didn't think I would be actually be receiving another intellectual stimulus. But this happened because of my work on the monuments. Some of them are heavily restored. Um, and you can read uh, JP's recent book, 2013 on the architecture and the restoration work uh, that's gone on at Tiwanaku, uh, and a section of it which was less restored uh, as of now, but back then it had been untouched. And these were large slabs, large stones from a temple that was completely smashed up. Uh, and our descriptions from the Spanish uh, is that the temple was not only amazing, huge, but also unfinished. So we have a situation where we have a temple that not only is destroyed, stones have been taken away, but it was never actually built at any time. Now I've been working on the Puma Punco, as it's called, for many years, and I sort of avoided this section because it was so complex. And if you type in Puma Punco, you will just go directly to the Ancient Aliens page. Uh, and it just goes down because of the fine work of the stones, in particular the andesite blocks. These are these H stones, and of course, here's holes made in stones only possible with extraterrestrial technology, which has brought people here in droves. And overall, I think millions of dollars has been spent there. And I'm not exaggerating when I say millions, people coming down here looking for Atlantis and so on. Now, of course, JP has been casually working on this, but um, who pays attention to archeologists when it comes to television and so on? Uh, they do keep calling me, um, but um, uh, I, I just can't be on that show. Anyway, <laughs> here's the blocks. Here they are. Now, what do we do with something like this? How do we put them together? I did receive funding a while ago to digitize it, scan it, photographic, photogrammetry, put it on the computer, and then spin it around and put it all together, or even try to find automatic ways of doing it. It didn't work. It really made me really angry at the computer. That was the only thing that it accomplished, was that. And I thought, well, with this new technology coming in, uh, when a 3D printing, I go, what do archaeologists do well? Well, we take little pieces of things, and then we make larger things with them. I go, can we reduce what we have at the Puma Punko down to a size that we can actually deal with and something that our minds have been trained, which is visualizing thing in three dimensions? Now, all that stuff that we had previously with laser scans, which was terabytes large, photogrammetry even larger, uh, I went back to simply the notes, Leon Sangrand, 1848. Some beautiful drawings here. Stubel, 1893. And the most important collection was from J.P. Protzen, uh, who graciously provided all of his notes from the, the work that he did. 
and his, um, the advantage of this is it includes each one of the measurements down to millimeter accuracy. Uh, with this, this was modeled, so we modeled this. When I mean we, I mean independent study undergraduates modeled this for a very long time. It kept going one after another, and once you have it, there's one of the gateways, it gets thrown into one of these programs, off to the 3D printing lab, and the printing process itself is one of the duller things you can do in archaeology, and that's saying a lot. Uh, considering it is, it just sort of drops millimeter by millimeter of dust onto this until you brush it off and then you put essentially the equivalent of crazy glue on top of it. And once you have it, you have these pieces that just feel great in your hand. And you sit there and this is the way that I did my research. I would wake up in the morning, have a cup of coffee, sit there and look at these pieces. And just like that jigsaw puzzle that you couldn't go any further the night before, you sit there and you're like, damn, this piece makes this one over here. So that's how it was, and that's how I kept it, with the cat in the background knocking <laughs> things over, and then these easy three-dimensional ways that you can make these connections. And then once you have something like that, as opposed to sticking it together, you can actually use the computer to say, these pieces actually do fit together, let's keep that. And then we can start doing these types of reconstructions. Surprisingly so, Tiwanaku and this building of this mature state looks exactly like the buildings that Christine had been excavating at Chiripa, showing a continuity all the way through from the early period. Now what else can we do with this? Well, we have plenty of buildings, plenty of things to measure, either large or small. Recent trip to Angkor, what a beautiful place, to even smaller items that are too fragile to be used or simply one example of it exists. So that's briefly my, uh, my work done with the 3D printing. Now for Cusco, here we go. After, let's see, my work in Bolivia ended 2006. I started to move over to the other side. Bolivia, it was difficult, difficult. And JP, you can, you can back me up on this one. Both the quality of life at Tiwanaku could be difficult, but the politics were also just, just terrible. You, every year, uh, there seemed to be a change in the president, the um, civil strife, civil war, so on, the permit process, and so on. Took the 12-hour bus ride over to the architectural gem of South America, the archaeological capital of South America, Cusco. That's a view of the uh, valley from the, uh, the monument of Sacsayhuaman over the city. And there's a plaza, which, after all these years, just doesn't fail to to amaze me every time I walk into this location. It is a beautiful city, still in fairly indigenous, um, and there's sections of it that you could almost imagine. You're like, wow, this, this is what like, the city looked like. There are Inca remains built into the city of Cusco. So we have the Inca Empire, perhaps 1200 to 1532. We have the Spanish colonial city, the modern city on top of it. So it is a gem of a city with this colonial courtyards, it's archaeological remains, but it is a city that's alive. There is traffic, there is lots of people, there is tourism selling all types of things, but there are also real markets and real folks, and this is where we have to go and buy our yama fetus for our ceremony um, every year. Christine, I imagine you've done the same with the yama fetus. How do you put that in receipts for the university? We call it a misa. Misa, okay, yeah, okay, I should have done that. Uh, the, so there's the Yama fetus. The city itself is very much alive with parades, protests, and festivals after festivals. It's to the point that you, the students wonder, why, why are there so many fireworks? I go, there's fireworks every day. Every day, every neighborhood has one festival or another and they dress up and they dance. It is a noisy, loud city. When you come back to the States, you realize what a quiet life we leave over here. And it's almost difficult not to go to sleep with the sounds of fireworks and thousands of barking dogs. Uh, you can actually get used to it. Cusco is heavily transited now, and the reason is, of course, Machu Picchu. Everyone who goes to Machu Picchu lands in Cusco, stays there for a little bit, off to Machu Picchu, sees that, comes back, and generally they stay about seven days in Peru. That seems to be about the, the shortest time period. Though I did a lecture on a cruise ship where they had a day trip to Machu Picchu flew them up, helicopter, helicopter back, flew back down. They were back on that buffet line on that cruise ship before anyone could think about it. So there they are, Machu Picchu. 
This is Sacsayhuaman. Uh, this is where we started working, and this is the fortress temple overlooking uh, the actual city itself. We'll be continuing to map this area, and this is where I got involved with work after Tiwanaku, because after some very heavy rains, some of these walls, which were considered to be just immovable, collapsed. And the reason they collapsed was because of the preservation efforts by the Institute of Archaeology there. Uh, they had simply misunderstood the hydraulics uh, and created an absolute mess. So in collaboration with the, the engineering department at UVA, we started a project here to understand the hydraulics of Sacsayhuaman, both for archaeological reasons, but also to apply it in the modern setting to tell the, uh, the INC, as we call it, or the Department of Culture, how to go about doing preservation on, on the monument. Um, so this is the continuing effort. This still hasn't been rebuilt, uh, and we're still in the process. The, the science is a lot easier than politically changing people's ideas on how things are done. Down into the city itself, here's a Google shot. We are up on top at Sacsayhuaman. That's the center of the city. That's a map from Brian Bauer showing the, the, uh, essentially the size of the Inca city with a center area that we're going to be concentrating on. Those are modern city blocks in light, in the small lines. In the thick lines are the uh, Inca walls. And when you do walk around the city, there's a couple of places and a couple of locations where you could almost imagine what it was like to wander around an Inca city. This is uh, just a beautiful little street uh, that's still preserved with the exception of those steps going up. But in fact, Cusco has been massively transformed in the last 500 years, with the most obvious one being the Spanish invasion. And the city was burned during the Great Inca Revolt and then rebuilt. Here we have the Cori Concha, the Temple of the Sun, and in Spanish, in good Spanish fashion, put a convent on top of it. Um, the walls of the great Inca compounds, in certain sections you see them, but in other places, as these compounds, which were huge, were distributed among different Spaniards, they punched out holes uh, to create you know, their own stores and so on, which now become modern uh, buildings like Paddy's Pub, the world's highest Irish pub that doesn't serve Guinness. So, yeah, there we go. There has been a couple of other big events. The 1650, there was a tremendous earthquake, and that allowed the Spanish to redesign the city according to the tastes of the time. And then in 1950, there was another tremendous earthquake, which destroyed everything, about 70% of the buildings. And I got a hold of the proposal. After that, there was a movement going, Cusco is old, we need to modernize it. And I saw the, all the, the plans for what they thought they were going to reconstruct Cusco with large apartment blocks, parking structures, malls. Absolutely terrifying how almost we lost this historic gem. Uh, that was stopped as they did a few houses and people were like, that's awful. Uh, so the preservation was made of the city. So that was something that we almost lost. That statue falling over and breaking, though, nobody missed that one. That was supposed to be an Inca, uh, of all things but I believe it was just a statue from, I don't know actually where, where that came from, but various different statues have graced the fountain on top. The other process that's gone on in Cusco as it's transformed from an Inca pre-Columbian city into a colonial modern city is the traffic and the transit. Nico can talk to you a lot about this. People walk around the Andes. Yamas have pads, not hooves, and they can go up and down stairs no problem. Um, the Spanish, of course, they had wheel, they had hooved horses, and these had to be graded and be graded over time. And with the most recent being with the invention, with the arrival of the vehicles, you can see the last of the century, the Inca stairs, or as they were at the time, uh, being sort of this half and half between traffic and stairs going on. So it went from a, from a stepped terraced city into a graded city. And the result is you have situations like this where you have the door well above the actual street. And I was walking with my friend, and he was walking, we were walking, and walking, and he just got further and further away. And I was like, what are you doing? Oh, it's like, and I realized that he had been walking up the steps as I had been walking along the stairs. That's Easton Rivers, who just did a, a wonderful uh, research project on the, uh, on the shrine surrounding Cusco. The big change, Machu Picchu. That brought a lot of tourists in here, and that became uh, essentially the primary economic engine of this place. Uh, here's an early view of the festival up at Sacsayhuaman, back when you could park your car 
and see the recreation of the Inti Rami, the Festival of the Sun, uh, something that was the last official one was 1535 before the Inca Revolt, and it started again in 1944, I believe. Um, and now it's become a major draw, not only in Cusco, but other towns have realized that, oh Lord, you know, tourists come to do this, we need our own Festival of the Sun. So it's actually multiplied across the continent. Uh, and Machu Picchu itself, of course, very crowded right now. There's an effort to see how they can limit the amount of people coming through here. And of course, there's all types of folks coming through to feel the, the power of the stones uh, and so on. Um, but that's one of our things that we have to deal with when we work in, in the mysterious South America. Now, Cusco itself, it's been mapped. It's been mapped many times over. One of the first better maps is Ephraim Squire, um, 1863. Max Ule with his collection and some of his work here uh, at the Hearst, also at UPenn and the Ibero-American Institute. Absolutely very detailed man. And what he did was he took Squire's map and traced it. Traced his city map on this one and then went about walking around. And it's from his descriptions, he says, I'm looking at this, but the city of Cusco is so disgusting, I just can't continue with some of these survey. Because of all these small little streets, Cusco was a very dirty city back then. So he spent some time and actually started seeing d differences in the stonework and starting up those divisions. It's been mapped many times over, 1950. A more detailed one was uh, in, done in 1980. Oh my. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, in 1980, which was a very, very detailed survey. Unfortunately, the majority of these notes have been lost. And the result is we have something like this, which is a lot of detail, but the internal aspects of the buildings have been completely lost. So when we do scan this and put it in, we have these walls floating unattached to things. Uh, unfortunate, but something very typical of Cusco, which is studies being done and then being lost just about immediately afterwards. This is from Brian Bauer, probably one of the better publications on Inca Cusco, where he shows more or less the, the distribution of the Inca walls. Now, there's a lot of debate over this wall, that wall, and you can easily become involved in Cusco in the cafes and the bars with the other archaeologists. These long discussions about this wall was here, my grandfather saw that wall, I have a pic, and they all have, I have a picture in the report and I'll give it to you tomorrow. Tomorrow has never arrived. Uh, for most of these reports and pictures and so on. Cusco is a place that once you finish your map, you hide it and then you wait. And to the point that mapping Cusco is nearly one of the most sustainable industries there is in Cusco, with always some agency or another actually mapping out the place. And then eventually these items become lost over time as that archive falls out of favor. And that means that a new agency can propose we need to map Cusco. So it's a it's a, one of the few cases of sustainable archaeology. Within the arguments over this wall, that wall, and so on, well, we have a general idea. Saxi Oman, which I mentioned, showed to you on top. In the middle, we have a central zone, which was the location of the majority, or nearly all of the houses. And when I say houses, the majority of the buildings, temples, palaces, and so on. An area C and B, which are described as being a lot of terraces. But in addition to this, Cusco was very much attached to its landscape. It had a series of um, ritual sites, uh, wakas, and they had these seke lines, these lines originating from the center of the city, walking through the city, and people would go and walk to each one of these sacred locations as a sacred narrative history was, was uh, told. And these things would ostensibly go across the entire empire, even leading up to the top of the volcanoes, where the uh, ch famous child sacrifices were made. And that was a way of tying in the entire empire into the center of the city. So we began our little project here of checking out Cusco. And I just wanted to show that's our house. So we were just so happy with that one. Wanted to show also happy students coming over here and probably somebody that's a colleague of ours from up north from Chico, Frank Baham, came down, uh, showed them faunal analysis, and we went to a uh, Yama herder and said, we want to buy a Yama. He's like, great. We want it slaughtered, yeah, but we just want the bones. 
And that was probably one of the stranger days for that guy, wondering why did gringos not want the meat? They just wanted the bones. But Frank and the team, they ex-carnated, fixed it up. We have a beautiful Yama fauna collection right there. Uh, this was a great project for the students starting off because a lot of the archaeology here is pretty apparent. You know, that, that is an archaeological feature right there. There's not a lot of problem with identifying that one. Here they are. We sort of started building up the general form of Inca Cusco uh, to the point that even at nighttime, we go out and we have uh, we take our maps and we did something called the, the Inca Wall Pub Crawl. And we'd go to several different bars that still had an Inca wall built inside of it. And we'd make a little note of it, perhaps have a drink, go to the next bar, and continue mapping our way. So we were, we were working all the time when we are down there. Once we got a little bit more into the detailed part of it, this is when I started collaborating with um, Bill Siller from UCL, University College London. And we'd print out, and our basic method was to take these maps that we had created, print them out, and go out there. Now, this has been mapped over 100 years, but one of the things about it is that errors in the maps get repeated over and over. Uh, and that's something very typical with, when it comes to this type of work. And other things were perhaps, like in this case, this was a wall with a Spanish doorway in the middle. They said that was an Inca wall. And for a century, a century, it's been put in as an Inca wall. In fact, it's a very early transitional wall. And you can see this was an attempt by the Inca architects to create this classical motif, but using their own technology right here. We were able to eliminate those transitional walls. Those were walls made during the colonial period, but by Inca masons that really confused people. Uh, we were able to add the new details, and we got more and more involved in getting in behind every nook and cranny. Good Lord, do we write letters to different institutions. This is, we finally got permission to go behind the cathedral itself. Another little bit. I've never been up there. That's about as close as I got to there. And eventually, of course, there are restaurants. And as Cusco becomes more and more touristic, a lot of these locations that were previously private houses and you couldn't go in for obvious reasons, now you can actually go in. And we would see a new restaurant and we'd go in and it's like, we're looking for a wall. And they're like, we have chicken and pasta. And it's like, no, 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 we're, we're looking for a wall. Uh, and they're like, oh yeah, 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 come in. And then we'd start measuring. And sometimes it'd be like, you can't do that. Or they would get, so eventually we decided if we wanted to research a place, we would go and eat there. Because while we're waiting for the food to come out, what difference does it make if we're measuring stones? The waiters would be like, gringos do strange things. This guy's measuring stones. And as we start talking, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, no. Check out the, uh, the kitchen. We got a, something in the kitchen. Go back there and check that out. Or even more monumental. Yeah, oh, yeah bathroom. There we go. Go that one. So uh, archaeology was really getting deep in here as we're measuring some of the uh, more monumental remains in the, in the continent, in the, in the bathrooms of uh, some of these places. Other locations, peeking through doors, climbing up over things. Uh, that's about as close as I got there. And also we had some old pictures prior to the modernization of Cusco. And this was covered over. This was the canal of the river being brought through Cusco. Uh, and this was covered over completely. And now it's become simply a river of raw sewage and we could see right there a little bit of the Inca stonework right there. But as this raw sewage is going through there, we figure we'll save that for, uh, for a thesis project for somebody else who wants to go down there. Um, but beautiful stonework there. But being in Cusco itself, and I had an opportunity to spend five months there, uh, walking out your door, you're doing research. And coming back late one night, I look, I'm like, wait, those stones are in place. Absolutely. The ones on the bottom. The ones on top, no. The ones on the bottom, yes. So I went and took a picture, put that on the map. There's always construction going on, which brings me into looking down at the different remains as the city has changed. And as Cusco becomes more and more popular destination, what had been almost an abandoned uh, convent over in one of these small plazas uh, became a luxury hotel. And as they put in the swimming pool, in that area there, they uncovered the base of one of these Inca buildings. This hotel here, I've gone in there a few times and good friends with them. Their, their presidential suite is $4,000 a night. But um, yeah, since I'm friends with them, I could get it down to $3,200 uh, in case anyone's visiting Cusco. Um, I'm still staying at my more modest place. So Cusco, is, it's astounding how much it's changed in the last 15 years. So the result of this effort of getting in historic pictures, 
previous maps, walking around, and also the discussions in the bars with the archaeologists and looking for some of these reports. Well, if we put it together, here's Squire's map, Uli's map, Aguto. Oops, better this one went away. I put it all together, and that's my map right there. Now, this is the result. And by the way, getting those maps all to coordinate on top of things involved a lot of stretching on GSI programs, but then afterwards just simply manually moving around. It was a tremendous amount of work to put that together. Going through this, I confirmed every little bit of wall there going, is it transitional, is it not, is it real, is it not, and so on. So when I put it all together, I go, fantastic, I'm done. I have the most recent map for Cusco. My name will be referenced when it comes to this. And then I became quickly dissatisfied because I'm wondering, what exactly did I accomplish? I added about maybe 5% more architecture that we already knew about before coming into this project. Uh, and a lot of that is from the recent construction and recent areas that have been opened up. And all those other things have been presented, and I'm still have this idea right here, and I started connecting the line to try to create an Inca Cusco. And as I met with other colleagues, we had enough for everyone to successfully argue their point on what a building looked like or where a wall went. We didn't actually come to any additional conclusions. Now, my time in Cusco, I'll be here for a while. So I go, well, what exactly is the step here, and what can we do to create an Inca archaeology of Cusco based on archaeology, in fact? We do have a surprising amount of ethno-historical information for Cusco, and the result is that, archaeologically speaking, it's a bit of a dead area. This right here, if published in other magazines, um, in other journals and so on, or into textbooks, when you look at the descriptions of Inca Cusco, it's pictures of archaeological remains, maps that decorate texts which are mostly descriptions or discussions of the historical record. This is a case of really archaeology being the handmaiden, and not even the handmaiden to history, but almost the, the uh, window dressing to, uh, to history. So what can we do? I'll be here for a few years, and I thought, well, can I start at least changing the concept of what this is? We call it a city, which is something I have a problem with to begin with, uh, but it also talks about palaces, grid systems, and so on. And when you look at the way that Cusco has been presented, this is 1565, obviously by somebody who did not ever see Cusco. They had a description that there was a fortress, water ran through the streets, and it was in a grid pattern. This is a Europeanized view of the flat city with a wall around it, but even more recent views of it still really accentuates the idea of a flat city with grids going across it. And if there are terraces, they're sort of odd. Uh, they're really not, not quite worked in there. I think you walk down here, and it's pretty much a flat city, easy to get around, no problem. We know the Inca were in the Andes, and they used it to dramatic effect, both to create some spectacular sites. They had no problem creating uh, an entire settlements on top of steep mountains, but also for the effect of distributing the water. This area of the Andes receives perhaps two meters of rain a year, all within a few months, and we saw that what happens when the Inca hydraulics went out on Sacsayhuaman, there's collapses. You also have these very large, heavy buildings being built on what we realized was a very marshy area. That's a shot of Cusco, 1950. That's about the size of Inca Cusco, I imagine. Uh, there it's its location in red, and it sits on basically, you know, fluvial clay. It's an old lake bed, uh, and all around it we have diorite, we have other types of stone and that, and the result is that there's water flowing into this area all the time. It is in fact a very marshy area, and quite frankly an awful place to decide to build a large heavy city. Uh, so a lot of modifications had to be done to say, well, to actually make this location livable. Um, here are the remains itself of all of them, and, we, and one of the things with these maps was that each one of these lines represents a wall on all these maps, and that could be a wall with stones 80 tons in size or ones with essentially little round cobbles. So we actually have started dividing them up into different types of categories, and one of the first categories is like, well, which ones are the terraces? These are the terraces. Let's start there. But still, we don't have enough 
We don't have enough to really reconstruct the terraced form of Cusco, but we do have a lot of architecture. And as the city was transformed from a terraced city to a graded city, it left, a little bit difficult, it left Inca remains floating. Oops. No, I don't want updates. There we go. It left, in this case, half of a doorway floating up on top. Here's another shot of an Inca wall, but there's the foundation. This had been dropped down as a street was created. We have Inca buildings floating above the city. We also have Inca remains below the city. This is some of the aspects that we can pick up when it comes to central Cusco, but for the majority of Cusco was actual just terraces, either agricultural, soon to be residential terraces. And ironically, one of the best ways to reconstruct Inca Cusco is by looking at the colonial form. We do have great documentation on how Cusco was transformed from the Spanish period all the way to the present and when things were built and how they were built. The initial Spanish simply took over some of the buildings. And in this case, the floor, the original surface is right there. Very easy one to determine right there. This is a case of just simply moving in. But the majority of the, of the area of Cusco was a terrace. And how do you accommodate? And this is a graphic in process, but the different ways that a building, a colonial building, would accommodate to uh, a terraced environment. And in this case, they can be built on top, built into, across it. They can have it halfway and halfway in there. How can you use the existing topography to your advantage, either as a back wall, as a second level, um, as something to build onto? Here's the case where the building's actually built into the platform. They emptied it out and put the large doorway. Over here, we have an example of a building on top of an Inca terrace, one built into it. And this is probably the location of the original Inca road that's been graded to go through. This is an example of how they would have been built in here. But in this case, we actually have the terrace. Over here, we have a very early Spanish building. And we know that this would have been built about fairly close to the original Inca surface. And you can see it, but caution here. Just found an old picture recently, realized that all that stuff there on the bottom is modern Inca. <laughs> modern Inca stuff they've been gone to. And actually, that's the level of the terrace that got cut into. So we were able to recreate that. And then we continue walking around, finding remains in here. Like, OK, there's a terrace wall. A building was built in front of it. And then you have buildings with absolutely no remains. But when you have a single building with a door down there and the other one up there, that's a really good indicator that a terrace ran right there and the building was built up against it. So all of these remains were able to bring it onto the map. And each one of those red dots represents a location where we could establish where the Inca surface was originally located. And here's a bit of a close-up view of it. And each one has its elevation, either based on the location of an Inca wall or the form of the colonial building. And once we had that, it sort of became a connect-the-dot style situation. Go a terrace running here, there, there. Then we'd model it in 3D. And then we'd have a terrace that was, because we had already had it on the topography, a terrace that was 15 meters tall. We're like, oh no, we need more terraces. Let's go back into the field. It became this back and forth between the 3D model and the 2D model. Here's a 2D map. And then this is what I suggest would be the location of the terraces. And once we put that, we can locate the terraces on the actual landscape itself. And right there, we just have a different idea and a different concept of what the city was like. And I look at the city not only as built on an incline, but taking advantage of the fact that it is in a waterlogged area. And by building this, there was a continuous source of water going through the rivers, but also all the sacred sites located within the city, nearly all of them associated with water. This would have been a miraculous place where there was a continuous and nonstop supply of water coming from different places. Now, what can we do with this and how can we continue? Because, again, we just have this problem when it comes to Inca Cusco that archaeology, we don't have an archaeology led by archaeological questions. We have archaeologists that end up using a lot of historic text. And of course, we do have a tremendous amount of it, uh, and we can use it. But what's preventing us? We have that idea. We have this structuralism combined with an Andean form of the ceremonial center that's been made as an axis mundi and as a magno mundi um, as a representation of the heavens that cannot be changed. 
Combine that with the idea that we had for the Inca of split inheritance, which means every emperor, when they uh, took power, everything that belonged to the previous emperor continued to belong to that person's mummy and their political party. And the new emperor had to conquer new lands and build a new palace, as the previous palace became the mortuary house of the previous emperor. Now, to a point, that's true, but the result is that Cusco itself seems like an idea that was created at one moment by almost a mythical emperor, Pachacutec, and then that form of this Axis Mundi was slowly filled in with additional palaces by each emperor. How can we go about actually including a little bit more of a diachronic perspective on Cusco itself? Now, the initial, initial thoughts, initial work that we did into this area shows that, no, in fact, Cusco was under a lot of modification, a lot of change, and any emperor that comes in, guess what? Probably acted like any other ruler that comes to a place. And they have the option of destroying something, modifying it, um, building something new, or even just sort of sidelining it and covering it up. Take an example over here. This is one of the famous walls in Cusco. This is a 12-sided angle stone. You can get yourself a picture with um, a real live Inca. And there's always people cluttered out in front of it. And these guides, and, and JP, you can, you can attest to this, the amount of awful stories and silly things that are said uh, in front of this over here. And, and unfortunately, JP demonstrated how this stone was made, and it's actually a rather easy situation, um, how to go about making this stone. But guides are up here telling stories, and when I take my students through here, because we'll hit a big bunch, and then there's people fighting to take a picture with the Inca, I go, okay guys, I'm going to give a lecture right here, but when I turn my hat, that's when I start making things up, and you guys continue nodding and taking notes. And I just describe the stone, it's this, and so on. And I go, this is 12 angle stone. It used to have 13 angles, do that. Uh, but the Spanish took one angle back to Madrid to make a triangle. And all the students go, like, they need to write that down. And all the other guides will be standing there. And uh, people go, and then we'll just continue walking. But here's this, here's this right here. Now, you can, it's difficult to see, but around the corner, you have another street full of uh, recent shops, and nobody pays attention to these folks because there is no 12-angled stone there. But then all of a sudden, here we are like this, no one's around there. They found themselves a puma, or a snake, or a cooey, uh, a guinea pig, or so on. And JP, is there anything there? They're making things up as, as they go along here. So the, uh, this has become sort of a create as you go. Now, even more on the more academic level, uh, recent work on it has done is like, well, this is the Ushnu. They've actually reconstructed that bit over there, which I believe is transitional colonial architecture, and then started creating Cusco, Inca Cusco, as a city with dual platforms in the middle of one looking at another and so on. When you pick up one of these old photographs, you realize, in fact, this wall was completely hidden by an Inca period wall. This was a very much an earlier construction when the Inca sort of grew into the imperial phase. For some reason, they decided to completely cover this up. And it's one of the reasons why it's probably been preserved so well uh, that it was covered up. This is a case of somebody going, something was big here beforehand, so we're just going to sort of hide it a little bit, at least on this side. Scholars talk about this as being the Ushnu, the center of the world, and so on, but there's no reference to it by the Spanish. I think they would have mentioned this was the center of Cusco if it actually was the center of Cusco. So we do have examples of architectural superimposition down on the Temple of the Sun. Uh, on the lower areas, we have this type of stonework made with green stone in a different masonry style, which they refer to as a pre-Inca, which is also found below ground. So we are able to at least talk about a period before imperial Cusco, uh, and then just to try to divide things up once we get to the actual stones and what's standing there with my colleague Bill Siller. Uh, he has uh, taking little measurements with his, uh, with his PXRF and to seeing where exactly these are coming from. We do know when we're running with the idea that each em Inca emperor used his own quarry, or at least certain quarries came into use when the area was conquered. So it's a very loose way of trying to date these different constructions. In the case of Machu Picchu, the bottom, a lot of the construction probably came from this quarry right here. Well, what else can we do 
when it comes to trying to uh, include an aspect of sort of diachronic change when it comes to Cusco. Good Lord, it really doesn't like that, does that? We'll just go slideshow. And then we'll start all the way at the beginning. I'm sorry. Hmm, it's all gone. Okay. You have to see the whole thing again. Going through that, colonial period, so on. Please don't crash. So here we go, and that's covered. What else can we do when it comes to trying to find, to include some sort of diachronic perspective on the development of Cusco? Well, we do have things like this. That's a street that was closed up. That is colonial. Clearly, the Spanish were modifying things. This over here. I think it's colonial. I'm not quite sure um, about it at all. How about this right here, which was a very simple wall going across. It didn't seem to have anything until construction along there when you realize that, in fact, that used to be a wall that was completely closed up, which means that these walls that we appreciate in Cusco right now, which are tall, encompassing large areas, are, in fact, the product of several buildings being agglomerated at different times by different emperors as they literally just captured different parts of the cities. So this wall appears continuous. We don't know, since the Inca were so good, where these streets, where these different buildings could have been in. And with that, we'll be continuing to see how the city itself developed as we're befuddled by things like this. I don't even know what to do with it. But every time in a city like this, where we have the center of the Inca Empire, where all the pilgrimage starts along these sacred nodes leading on to the landscape, if you modify the urban fabric, you modify history and memory. And every time that's done, it's completely changed. Now, this is something that's been going on when it comes to archaeological research in the provinces. People have been looking at the transformation of an area when the Inca arrived, so wondering, can we see that transformation from town, city, to imperial capital within the stones of uh, Cusco itself? And with that, I hope you guys can come in to visit me in Cusco. It's a fine, lovely place with uh, a lot of good, fine eating establishments. Thank you. Thanks very much. And we do have time for questions. And again, if you have to leave before the uh, session ends, feel free to do that. Okay. Uh, so I'm looking at Cusco and thinking about the archaeology there. So do they have a program <clears throat> like we have here, a cultural resource management, with all the development that's going on? Do they, does the city, do they actually have some uh, staff of archaeologists to do anything, or is it just kind of totally random? Or how, 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 is that, how is that done such a historic uh, capital resource? Cultural resource management at Cusco. There's a tremendous amount of work being done there by the Department of Culture, IMC. Those names change every election mm -hmm. and what they call the department. Uh, but within that, the, 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 the difficulties of the bureaucracies um, that are there. Mm -hmm. Archaeologists do excavate. Some of them are good, some of them not so good. Mm -hmm. There is a tremendous rush to liberate monuments of dirt so that tourists can see that. Once archaeologists finish, then it gets handed over to an architect. <clears throat> and the architect does not really have any idea of the archaeological excavation process, and then makes the ruins new and shiny, the way tourists want to see them, they imagine. Now, what happens to that information? Well, unfortunately, because of changes in government budget cuts, the moment one of these projects ends and the funding drops, those reports disappear. And then you find yourself in this long process of meeting with archaeologists going, who has that report? My friend has that. It's like, I'll get it to him. The friend shows up. It's like, I'll sell it to you for $200, but I can't buy it. And we're going through that slow process. Right now, we've located nearly abandoned in the airport but all, these, all these reports that are there. And I'd be delighted to scan, to use them, to check them out. But that's going to take a lot of political 
maneuvering until they, the department decides to reveal this information, which they feel is theirs, and they should show it, and they should have almost hidden. Okay. So yeah, there is work being done, but what happens to that work? Okay. Other questions? Yes, I would have, but then I have to go, so we have to get together. We'll have coffee again. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you again for all your help this morning. Thank you, Christine. Yes, have you um, integrated into these Cusco maps any of the Men, I've got one compound walled in five different rockets. What does that mean when it comes to their rivals, and can they use those same type of virtual pathways? So now we're in the process of bringing in the safety system into the city itself. And I showed you a picture of Eastern Rivers from Columbia, who just finished a fantastic survey of one of the uh, sections of Cusco to, to mark down all of the locations of the Wacas and the second points. So yes, that's how we're going to value it and bring that into the city. Yes? Um, so we've been doing some sourcing of the stones that are actually in the city. Have you been able to do any sourcing or get data on the sourcing for nearby stone lines to try and correlate the nearby temples and the nearby other stone lines with constructions of the city? So if the idea is that each emperor has his own quarry, then their specific palace in another location should be the same quarry. Okay. So we're trying to see that. And we do these things from like Uchio Cusco, another palace uh, location, and where that stone is being found uh, within Cusco itself. That's the whole process. Um, so the so you're mapping the valley uh, hydrology for the city of Cusco. You're, you're trying to Imagine what the water channels were like. Um, and are you combining a lot of the, the soil maps as well? I saw you had the, the stone mm -hmm. geology maps um, to come up with the lake. And, and I'm curious how you're doing that. And, and it looked like maybe you had a 3D model already developed. Yes, we have that? a 3D model on top of the geological model. We have the, the movement of the hydrology on top very well. Manage down to the micro, micro um, water catchment areas. When it comes to the rest of the city, I fear it's going to have to remain rather hypothetical because of the amount of change that's gone on there. <clears throat> Theoretically, it falls in well with what scholars like Colin McKinney are talking about these, these liquid plazas. And that water from Saxon from one temple to the sun works its way through the city and maybe to the other temple the sun, one way or another. So we can only go so far when it comes to replicating the, all the water movement. So it's, it's really impressive seeing the way that you are reinstating the terrace nature of the city. Um, and I presume that means that uh, you would advocate for not using the flat geometry maps since they're going to always mislead people about that. Yes. Um, one of the other things that that made me think about is, are you doing things with you shed? Because with that kind of terracing, the impression people have of what the, what the aspect of the city would be like should be really different than, than what's implied by the time. <coughs> Absolutely. The, yeah. the flat map, you say there's a plaza, there's a plaza in the middle. That is a European Spanish concept of a plaza-centric city. Uh, Cusco itself, you could almost describe it as a series of plazas with views that are connected to one another. Uh, and one plaza will have a view of certain astronomical and landscape alignments. Other plazas will have great views of um, themselves and other people. And the one building that's always been put to the back, Manco's Compact Palace, and they say this was where the Spanish put them off there. In this respect, when you look at it, it's a very privileged position. So it's transformed the city from plaza-centric grid to a place of multiple viewing stations yeah. that are connected to one another. 